Um, my name is uh, Rafael Minda. I am a correspondent for the New York Times. I'm based in Madrid. I cover Spain and Portugal. I'm not an Indian specialist. I've uh, been lucky enough in a prior reporting life to go to India on several occasions, but it's a long time ago, and much has changed in India since. Um, we have been here basically following on from the um, panel we just had on the transformation of India, um, dealing with a specific topic, that of foreign direct investment, um, and basically asking whether uh, India is looking more attractive for foreigners than it was. I think obviously, as uh, we're all aware, we are meeting a month after an election which uh, many have described as a political miracle. Uh, Prime Minister Modi was not expected to win the landslide victory that he did win, and uh, he is now, by Western uh, democracy standards, one of the most solid leaders on the planet. Uh, very few uh, government leaders can claim to have the kind of control that he has uh, of parliament and also essentially in a situation where his party, the BJP, is not uh, uh, dependent on the support of smaller parties. So if he can move forward with a strong agenda, the question is how strong that agenda will be. Um, I was um, basically struck by some of the uh, debates at the moment about the figures of India, and maybe we can address that. Um, we've even had uh, a former chief economic advisor recently published um, um, a study from Harvard uh, questioning whether India has been growing at the 7% uh, rate that was officially given in recent years, and suggesting that probably that growth should be more like 4 to 5% a year. In other words, uh, that would mean India not only is not uh, overtaking China, but it's actually grow has been growing slower than a country like Indonesia. Uh, how important is that for uh, foreign direct investment? And also, how much can India benefit from what I would call a favorable geopolitics? Uh, by that, I mean that uh, as China and the U.S. Uh, get engaged in what looks like a very ugly trade battle, how much uh, reshifting will there be? How much of the manufacturing that has gone to China could go to India? And how clever can uh, the Modi government be in terms of balancing the fact that China will remain a key uh, partner with the possibilities of making itself more attractive to American uh, investors. Um, with me today, I have some very distinguished uh, panelists. Um, I will uh, briefly, briefly introduce them. Uh, at the far end, Rajiv Kohl is the former president of the All India Management Association, one of the co organizers of this meeting. He's also the chairman of the Nikko Group, which is a conglomerate that covers, uh, I would say, pretty much everything. Uh, person from petrochemical engineering, uh, manufacturing of cables, and entertainment part. Um, we've got uh, a minister with us, uh, Rana Gomez from Sodi, Minister of Sports and Youth Affairs in, in uh, Punjab, and we have uh, Mr. Ron Summers, closest to me, who is the founder and chief executive officer of the India First Group, that uh, consultancy uh, helping, uh, consult, uh, helping companies invest in India. Uh, he's an American with a background in the energy sector and a long experience of India, having worked there for 12 years. And uh, we finally have uh, Mr. Jonathan Lebre, who is uh, who comes from background in the British Parliament, where he works as an advisor. As now the chief strategy officer of the International Integrating Reporting Council, which is a coalition of regulators essentially trying to apply integrated reporting standards globally. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, will ask the person to call and will move in that direction and toward me to give us some brief thoughts on, on, on these issues. How much optimism should we have that a strengthened Modi administration? will be good news for foreign investors. Well, uh, thank you and uh, hello everyone. It's great to be here in uh, beautiful Segovia and in this lovely ambiance. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, I would agree a lot of the points you said, right, including the fact that Modi, Prime Minister Modi's uh, re-election in a truly outstanding fashion is great news for India and it's great news for foreign direct investment. Because one of the ingredients for foreign direct investment and encouraging the thing is continuity, stability, a strong leader, and confidence globally. Right? He's given all these plus he's given a lot of stability within India. And that is outstanding news for foreign direct investment. Now, just to put it in perspective, and you talked about certain figures, and you've been to India a long time ago, but it took India 60 years from our independence from the British Empire to achieve the one trillion US dollar figure, economy GDP figure. 60 years. But the next trillion was achieved in 2015. So in 2007, we became one trillion. It took 60 years. And then in the next eight years, we achieved the next trillion, 2015. We are almost at 3 trillion today, as I, as I, as I talk. And we will definitely cross 3 trillion this year. And we are well in our way for achieving a 5 trillion economy by the year 2020. Right? 2025. Now, that's also the target where Modi has given himself as Prime Minister when he goes into the next election, where he's hoping to win you know, for the third time. And it's, it's possible because he's a strong leader, he's a great orator, he believes in action, and he delegates power right down to the wire, particularly in the Prime Minister's office, where results do come from. Now, having said that, India has already, in the year uh, 16 and 17, been the recipient of the largest green field foreign direct investment in the world. We overtook China then, all right? So we slipped a little bit in subsequent years, that is in 18, and 19 figures are not out as yet. Let's hope we get back as number one. But we have been doing it to become number one. And therefore, when we take a target of 100 million, which is what the target is taken upon ourselves in government and in the private sector to achieve, I think there's a high degree of confidence that in India today, we will achieve. Let me pause now, and there are many more points, but I think we have a, a large panel, and for my, what I see, 41 minutes, 41 minutes left. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Everybody, good evening. Uh, and I'm really glad that the uh, uh, chance has been given to me to come and uh, take part in this kind of uh, debate, <coughs> which is really good for the nation and for everyone. And uh, at the end of the day, I would say it's good for the global fraternity. Uh, you know, India being uh, the uh, highly populated with a population of 1.3 uh, billion population, uh, which makes 17.74% uh, of the total world population. And uh, it is surprising that the median age is about 27 years, which uh, I would say uh, makes India a very young country. And uh, with this, I would say there is an immense potential for the, the FDI to come foreign investment to India. There is no doubt that uh, we were, uh, uh, you know, earlier quite conservative about all this, and it took us much time to liberate ourselves and come forward 
to think about uh, FDI. And uh, in times to come, uh, we were doing about quite a good in the uh, last few years. We did about 42 billion uh, US dollars. But suddenly we declined also first time uh, in 2018 and 2019 uh, in two, three things like, uh, for example, telecom, pharmaceutical, and power. So, uh, keeping in view, uh, the, there is so many problems which India is facing, like uh, unemployment and uh, the GDP growth. I think FDI uh, is the, uh, maybe we are being critical driver of the economic uh, growth, but FDI is the major uh, source of non debt financial resources of the economic development for India. So, I feel. Uh, 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 you know, to come forward, uh, the government of India is no doubt reformed certain things and made it uh, mandatory for the FBI any proposal to be cleared in 10 weeks. So, but I think still we are looking forward for uh, uh, more easy ways where, uh, you know, the foreigners and the foreign companies could come and, uh, you know, they put in their money where their uh, investment should be assured. All these things, uh, you know, matters a lot when somebody leaving his hometown and coming to another country for investment and uh, uh, giving jobs to that country. So I would also uh, like we are here, and uh, I would also request my NRI brothers that they must come forward to work on this and to solve this. Help India. Uh, bringing uh, uh, foreign direct investment, and uh, I am sure with their connections because they are highly placed. If you talk about Canada, America, they are even uh, part of the government. And uh, I feel uh, if they put in their resources and sources and their connections, uh, it is need of the art that uh, the population India has today could be channelized. Uh, with the foreign direct investments and many companies, maybe it is, it's a, a lot of demand in food processing, agriculture, implements, various other, uh, you know, industry is required in India. Maybe the defense also is now open. Civil aviation, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, it's a big uh, industry which is coming up in India and we are looking forward for uh, FDI. So I feel uh, uh, all these things are uh, very important issues at this moment uh, for India to, uh, you know, make more uh, easy, uh, you know, to bring uh, FDI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. And good evening, good evening everyone. And it's a pleasure, of course, to follow the Minister in making my opening remarks. And what I'd really like to do is deep dive into one of the one of the issues that really influences the attractiveness of any market, any company, any country, particularly India in the current context, to foreign direct investment. And that issue is the issue of corporate governance, and in particular, the area that I'm most focused on in my remarks, which is corporate reporting. The transparency of companies, Indian companies, to the capital markets, to the global capital markets, and particularly to, it, to international institutional investors and the changing expectations of those institutional investors. And I think the story is one of, of hope and confidence when we look at the Indian markets, because the world of investment is really changing, and it's changing at a rapid pace. Research from the United States shows that financial statements today represent about 16% of the value of a company. And yet when we think about companies and their transparency and their reporting, Often it is the profit and loss, the balance sheet, the cash flows. They're the things that we tend to go to to see, to get a snapshot of the company's performance. Yet so much of the performance of the company today is accounted for in the intangible value, the human capital, the intellectual capital, the patents, the copyrights, how companies manage their people to get the best out of them, to drive productivity. These today are the determinants determinant of over 80% of the value of companies. And investors internationally are wanting companies to use global frameworks to help them to explain how they create value over the short, medium, and long term. 
And through the initiative, and there are many initiatives in the world, but the one that I work on with the market in India is called Integrated Reporting, where we're trying to get companies to communicate their business model and their strategy and how they are using all the resources that are available to them, not just financial resources, in order to create value over the long term. And that is helping us to transition to a different kind of capitalism, and it's a capitalism that I know is very much alive, or this debate is very much alive in India. The transition from a financial capitalism, a capitalism when we've only been looking at financial resources, to a broader base of what we call inclusive capitalism, where companies, societies, governments look at the broader range of factors that contribute to societal and economic performance, and make sure that we're measuring those, because what you measure is what you manage, and what you manage is what, in, what, is what investors are really interested in to help them to allocate their capital. So the IRC, the, the organisation that I work for, we're not for profit, we're a global coalition. And in fact, Parker Steel, the Institute of Charter and Accountants of India, um, Philosophy Brothers, and um, I know we're represented on the last panel, um, and our, the one on our board is UK Sinha, the former chair of the Securities and Exchange Board of India. But we have others from the, the world, the World Economic Forum, the world's largest equity investor in the world, BlackRock, and the major, major accounting firms and bodies as well. And they're all devoted to improving corporate governance and corporate reporting by bringing the idea of multi-capitalism to light within economies and within businesses, where companies not only report on their financial capital, but also their social capital, their human capital, and intellectual capital. And that combined multi-capital view creates a very clear sense of how organizations are creating value in the modern world. And what investors are also looking at before they invest in, a, in particular markets are clear lines of sight. And when we look at corporate governance and how it has developed over the last 30 years internationally, we've got, we've mastered oversight and we've mastered hindsight. But what investors are looking for now is insight into the boards and top management of companies about how they're managing those resources and stewarding their companies for the long term. And we only have to look at how the climate change debate and the debate around how we implement the sustainable development goals is taking off around the world to see that there is a vast opportunity in the world of green finance for attracting a new layer of investment and a new layer of economic growth and prosperity. And the fourth line of sight that investors are looking for to complement hindsight is foresight, that forward-looking view about how organizations are managing risk and opportunity to plan for the future. And we're delighted that the new Corporate Governance Code of India that was, that was released in April makes reference to companies really being explicit now both about the risks they face and about their forward-looking strategy, because that is exactly the kind of information that, that investors are looking for before they allocate capital into, into companies. And so there are just three final points that I wanted to make. Firstly, India is making a really great contribution to this debate of changing and transforming corporate governance and corporate reporting. The Securities and Exchange Board of India issued a memorandum to the top 500 companies in India last year, asking them on a voluntary basis to adopt integrated reporting. And we're expecting 50 of the top companies this year to start reporting against this international framework. And there are also examples that we would invite Indian companies and others around the world to draw upon from other markets, particularly in Malaysia, but also um, close to home in, in Sri Lanka, that are, uh, that are adopting this um, form of reporting in order to help track um, FDI. Um, and finally, one of the markets in the world from Asia, but from a different part of Asia, that adopted integrated reporting in a mainstream way three or four years ago was Japan. And it really was the Japan Stock Exchange that looked at the market in Japan and the predominant companies on that market that were completely reliant on technology, um, on intangible value, the patents and copyrights and trademarks of the companies that are listed on those companies, the bit on the, on the exchange. And they were saying, you're not explaining the value that is inherent within your companies. And as a result, the Japanese market was underperforming compared to other markets in the world. 
And now, as a result of this new form of reporting that is reporting on this multi capital agenda, we're seeing a massive increase both in the performance of the companies on the Japanese market, but also the strength of the corporate governance system in Japan, as evidenced by surveys and as evidenced by a much greater focus now from um, international investors in the Japanese market. So, I think it's a story of hope and confidence, and in India, very much is on this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, let me, uh, let me give you some forward reporting. I think you'll appreciate it. And that is that why should we be confident and optimistic about what we're seeing in India? We have just witnessed the largest democratic undertaking in human history. 900 million people registered to vote, 67% voter turnout, a seven phase election beginning in mid April, lasting until May 22nd, 67% with ink on their fingers having cast their ballot in a major democratic election of historic proportions. That's extraordinary. The other reason that we should be taking confidence from India is not only are they a democracy where they embrace freedom and an open market system, as we all do, is the demographic that we've all referred to here on this panel. Fifty-four percent of the 1.3 billion people are under the age of 25. When you walk out of an airplane, everyone is half your age. I mean, my goodness, this is a young, dynamic country that actually embraces the entrepreneurial deal of all the global leaders in the entrepreneur world. Name it Bill Gates, the new ones that are coming up in Silicon Valley. This is a country on the move, 54% under the age of 25. We must take confidence in that. That's my forward thinking on my optimism. Now, we heard me in the previous two panels the contraction of the world economy. That's troubling to me. And therefore, if I had 10 minutes with Mr. Modi, two of the four, four things that I would whisper in his ear where he must attend, and he knows it very well. When you have a young population with that kind of 600 million people under the age of 25, the headline is jobs, jobs, jobs. And you have to get on it right now because it takes a while to build up the infrastructure to create those jobs. And, and how do you get these jobs? Well, we have to be working towards our reform process. In my background in India, since 1991, every government that has come to power has been forward progressing the economic reform system. I mean, it's really been remarkable whether you're BJP or Congress or third front, you're always going to be advancing the economic reforms. And in this case, what are the economic reforms that Mr. Modi needs to be doing right now in order to be creating a million jobs a month? That's what he must do. He must create a million jobs a month to maintain status quo. And here we are in the United States, from Washington, D.C. is where I come, where we're lucky if we have a 200,000 jobs per month growth rate. Mr. Modi must meet a million jobs every month. And so, number one, you cannot run a great economy without electricity and power. Uh, as we heard in the last panel, only 1,200 kilowatt hours per person per year are being consumed by, uh, by the average Indian. 1,200 kilowatt hours per person per year? We all consume that much electricity every month. So they must go in India on a massive infrastructure buildup. The numbers are enormous. A trillion dollars at least. And certainly, $300 billion of that is going to be in power. That's not going to come from the Indian banks. They're already exhausted, as we just heard from the last panel. We need foreign direct investment to come in. To do that, you have to have a paying customer. And to have a paying customer, we have to find creditworthy people who are paying for that power. And the examples that we've seen in India are right before our very eyes. Calcutta has always been financially viable. Why? The Calcutta Electric Supply Company, CESC, Omdivide, Bombay, private sector distribution systems. What Mr. Modi must do is he must enable all the big cities in India, 67 cities over the population of 1 million, to privatize their distribution and invite the talkers, the reliances, all the big corporates to come in and run their distribution systems. That's going to make the whole industry more viable. Second, 
if I could just ask Mr. Modi to open multi-brand retail. More jobs would be created every month if you can open and organize the retail sector. Open up e-commerce in a big way. Don't be afraid of it. We've learned the lesson in the past. The faster you get the private sector of India into the gov- into these large sectors of the economy, the faster it grows and it creates these things off jobs. We saw that in telecom. Telecom sector opened in 1992. It's the first sector that opened. And today, there are 650 million cell phones operating in India. Today, 10 million cell phones being issued every month because of the private sector involvement. So don't hold back. Don't hesitate. Open up multi-brand retail. That's going to be your by far biggest job creator going all the way back to the farm where right now every harvest, 40% of the vegetables rot before they reach market. We need to work on that as a structure, on an entire logistics chain, and that's going to involve the private sector. And then the, the thing where I really need the government to be involved, the government has to be involved in the skilling process. Every young person graduating or 10th grade needs to learn skills to be able to build out this billion dollars of infrastructure. And I wonder to myself, you know, should we get the government out of that and have that only be by the corporate, or should the government stay in that? And I think that's the FDR in the United States and the lesson of the, the Civil Conservation Corps. Is there no way to have big pieces of India built out, the post offices, the roads, the brick lanes, all of those wonderful things that you can do if you train a workforce as a national priority. And I would argue that a CCC program for Mr. Modi might be very much in order to put those young people to work. And then the last point is that we really need to be deepening India's strategic partnership with the western part of the world. China is the big challenge to the north. Let's not ignore that fact. It's China that's causing the problems in Pakistan. It's China that was camped on the Bhutan border just a matter of nine or 12 months ago, uh, forcing India to, to make its entire uh, shift. And thank God Mr. Jai Shankar is there as a, a foreign affairs minister to be recognizing this fact. The closer that India becomes to the Western world, including to the United States of America, the, the better it's going to be for everyone. And in the bargain, what happens when you have India cooperating with the West? With that kind of high technology, strategic technology, all that technology comes first. And that again bolsters India's ability to create opportunities and to create jobs. And then the last point I would whisper in the Prime Minister's ear is, sir, no backsliding, particularly no backsliding on intellectual property. You've had a great record in your first term on IT. You've developed an entire ecosystem where innovation is, is rewarded and appreciated. And the way you do that is by issuing patents and honoring the intellectual property system. And if we can get Mr. Modi to agree that that's the path forward, that innovation is the future, then you can create a million jobs per month. India's young population will be working. India will remain a vibrant and active democracy. And India will be a force to be reckoned with in a very positive way for all the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, unfortunately, we don't have Prime Minister Modi with us today, but I hope uh, someone will relay that good advice to him. Um, I wanted just uh, to come back to actually a couple of the points that were just made by uh, Mr. Ron Sala. Um, the jobs um, uh, in the India uh, created uh, in 20 years about 41 million manufacturing jobs. While China used that time to create about 226 million, uh, with um, all the population, as you've all pointed out, India has the big advantage of having a much younger, younger population. Um, what, what do you think are the prospects for this uh, job creation? After all, unemployment is one of the sensitive issues that we saw with the. Uh, the data, the, the data, and the refining of the release of the data, the accuracy of the data. What are the prospects really to attract foreign investment in the manufacturing? If I may jump in there so, and uh, say that undoubtedly China is the manufacturing hub of the world. Right? And it is still so, irrespective of uh, 
what President Trump does or not. It will stay as the manufacturing hub of the world. Having said that, it is a lot of job, which we just said. India, on the other hand, is the back office of the world. It's the digital office of the world. And our jobs are not coming in manufacturing as they should perhaps be, but they're coming in industry. Right? And that's where India is strong and powerful. More than 60% of our GDP comes from services. Industrial uh, is only around 23-24%. The rest is agriculture. Right? So, the whole uh, developmental model that India has is different. Having said that, we have 18 million children being born every year in India. 18 million. And approximately 4 million deaths a year. So our incremental population is 14 million a year. So roughly, we need to take a decision. Do we give a job for every person? Probably not. So if we give a job for every second person, then we need in the future to create 7 million jobs. If we need to give uh, maybe 60 to 10 people jobs, then we need to multiply it by 0.6. So in any case, I think it's nice to say we need to create a million jobs a month, but not everybody in the family anywhere in the world works. Very, very rarely. But it's, it is a challenge. And uh, we are creating jobs. But we are creating a lot of jobs in the informal sector, which is not recorded. And India perhaps has one of the worst uh, methods of recording jobs. I mean, if I have a chauffeur working at home, he's not documented as an employed person. But he's getting a salary, he's living, he's bringing up his family, but he's not still documented. So this is a big challenge for the Indian government. And of course, there is poverty in India. We have uh, what about 300 million very poor people. And we have 1.1 billion people who are, who can afford, you know, few things. And as a result, they have a large market. If you look at a simple thing like edible oil, even a poorest of poor person requires perhaps two teaspoons of oil to put his food in. So look at that market. 1.4 billion people into two teaspoons a day. That's what? 2.8 uh, you know, billion people of oil a day. Two footwear. That's the same kind of market. You know? So uh, India is a huge market and FDI comes in where there is a market. And India today is one of the most open places for foreign direct investment in the world, even more than the USA. And you know, what you were talking about, Johnson, was financial institutional investment, not greenfield investment. Because when you talk of corporate standards, it's not, it's not a guy going in with his money to, to create a factory or to create a service. So whilst you're very right, and I'm happy you said that India is now taking uh, the lead in, 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 in this area, and I know that because I'm a couple, I have a small company, and the number of conformity I have to do because I'm listed is atrocious. We spend a lot of time and effort and money. Okay, I don't think it's really necessary. But okay, it's necessary if you have uh, the big pension funds in the world investing in you. But anyway, let me pause now. I think I've said enough. Indian country, and uh, most of the Indians live in the rural area, and their job is professional agriculture. So unless we work on uh, those things, those uh, uh, units, setting units, maybe uh, food processing or uh, regarding something which is to do with the farming, we will not be able to solve the uh, unemployment. Issues as there is a, uh, we also have to balance the literacy sector and the jobs. 
how much people are graduating in what field, whether they are skilled, semi skilled, and then we have to work accordingly. I would say even the FDI, which is uh, in need of the arm, and I feel if India is uh, really reforming and the present government takes a right step, we can uh, increase our FDI from uh, you know up to 100 billion in coming two years. But we need to have set up those kind of units, manufacturing units, where we need. Uh, in India, everybody is not a highly skilled. So we need to put up those manufacturing units which uh, uh, give jobs to semi-skilled and unskilled, maybe like in infrastructure or uh, uh, textiles or other things where you need that kind of people who could easily adopt that job and uh, work and get the employment. So these are two things which I think needs uh, a, a micro-study to do all these things and then come up and then approach uh, the FBI and various other uh, people who are sitting in foreign land to come back to India and invest as per the requirement. First, we have to generate the requirement of what kind of people. We, we can't set up a IT units and then we look for uh, skilled people. And there are no skilled people. There are uh, uh, 2,000 applications and only 50 people qualify for that job. So we have to see where we advertise a job. If there are 2,000 people, at least there should be 1,500 people who could be in job. So these are certain things which we have to look into details and do the micro-study uh, when even the FBI is coming. And uh, secondly, we, uh, as I mentioned, Punjab, uh, which is a land of great opportunity, and it is known as a food basket of uh, India. So we are uh, quite liberal. We are we have set up a special window for FBI in our uh, government, and my chief minister is very keen that we look forward for the various uh, uh, regarding uh, food processing and uh, cycle parts, auto parts, and uh, hand tools, hosiery. So these are the uh, you know few fields which uh, which are the need of the art to set up. FDI, uh, bring FDI in. So, anybody is welcome and uh, we will extend full cooperation and uh, give uh, that company or that FDI who is bringing all the, uh, you know, facilities, uh, whatever the best could be, happen under the present rules and regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, uh, um, you mentioned the um, great advantage of stability and continuity when you have a government leader who is not only re-elected but re-elected with a majority. Um, I, I wanted to ask, do you think um, uh, Mr. Modi is now emboldened to make more ambitious reforms? Do you think foreign investors should expect a more ambitious agenda? And perhaps, do you, do you think, on the stability continuity, do you think there is the potential for some of these ambitions to backfire? There was a lot of uh, talk about the demonetization policy of uh, 2016, which is, I think, now seen as a, as a mistake. Uh, do you think um, Modi, sure, of his political power might embark on some things that will make investors jittery? Do you think that to backfire? It will backfire in the election. And it will all forward fire it. In the sense, he cleans out most of the opposition all over India. And as Rob pointed out, it was the biggest democratic exercise in the world. And very, very few people get it right. Ron is perhaps an exception because he, he is pretty accurate in his forecasting. Maybe he has a private line to Prime Minister Modi. But whatever it is, it, it's good. And, you know, I, I think there's nothing going to stop him. We had already committed our finance minister that they're going to lower taxation. Well, he began it with the small company, SMEs himself. Now, I'm sure it will now move on to the last scale. Now, when you reduce taxation, you're definitely encouraging the world to look at you. And what is FBI? What is FII? 
It's basically global savings coming into your country. And India, although it has a reasonable uh, saving rate ourselves, around 30 percent, but getting global savings on top of that creates that additional momentum which we desperately need to create the jobs, to create the economy. And we have a huge need. We have, we, today, India is a consumption led economy. We need to add on to that consumption led economy an investment led economy. We have such a large need on roads, on ports, on power. Right? And when I talk about power, I'm not talking about the, the polluting thermal power plants, but we have the most ambitious plan in the world when it comes to solar power. And we are, we are on track. It's one of the two things we are on track. Modi is behind it. He monitors it every quarter. He makes sure that anything coming on the way is removed. The hurdles are removed. But we will well, run. Let me just jump in. I, mean, I, I think it's quite interesting that also the, the foreign minister, who is not a politician, was now appointed to become the minister of external affairs. That's an extraordinary event because I think that Jaya Shankar, and follow him now, read your economist and follow him. If you're going to school here, you need to be watching the name Jaya Shankar. He will recognize, I believe, the importance of the economy for India from a geopolitical standpoint. So in that sense, he's more than just foreign minister. He actually becomes part of the finance ministry's strategic thinking. And I think that's going to really drive India forward because he's going to understand that all of this FBI is so important. All these linkages are so important in order to be able to strengthen India for the long future. This is a, a great moment in history. Too. So in that sense, your question really is, Raphael, could, will, will something like another repeat of a demonetization like reform uh, possibly pop up? I think he's going to have some very good advisors now saying, here's what we need to do to actually double down and strengthen this economy. And so I'm very optimistic. Yeah. And, and in fact, we have our uh, ambassador sitting here. We are champions for India's growth. You know, I've been around a long time. 20 years ago, that was not the approach. But over the last 20 years, all of them have been big supporters of foreign director investment. Uh, previously, you know, the business was bad. If I was a businessman, I was uh, someone to be counted. But no longer. Today, we are working in partnership. And we have a lot of support from government. These are government overseas, represented by you know, ambassadors and high commissioners, or at home with you know, people working under him, the bureaucracy working under ministers. And dynamic ministers, as you can see, he's, he's a person it, you know, over here with very clear thinking. So and and then corporates like Papa and others are also great when you Absolutely. Absolutely, Ron. I'm, I'm going to use, use the last few minutes. Hello. I feel it in Central, and uh, which is a very, very important and safety of your money of the people who are coming from abroad and invest, and uh, the security and the, uh, you know, uh, relaxed way of movement of their money and their further investment is the need of the hour, which Modi government should think about it. And they should make it a completely professional. I mean, it should not be a red petition or anything else should be cut off completely if we want to bring FBI, which is uh, going to give a great, uh, you know, push to the country and this uh, problem of unemployment and other uh, things which are... Now, we are facing problems of both, you know, in India, we are also uh, at the moment facing drinking water. Infrastructure is... Uh, there is an infrastructure, there is a development, but still we need more. Look at the population. You know, it is growing uh, in least and bound. So, we, unless uh, we think about it and unless we relax our system and uh, cut off those that take, uh, you know, uh, permissions and licenses and other things, we have to make them easy. So, this is uh, what the government should do at this moment. And, and today, you know, that's 
like he comes from Punjab, and then he comes from Punjab, each state is competing with each other for investment, for foreign direct investment, for internal investment, for uh, ease of doing business. Everybody is very conscious for improving the ranking and ease of doing business within India. That competitive spirit is common and embedded, not just in the private sector which Ron was championing, but even in the public sector, the state sector. They tremendously competitive. I think every year or every second year, they have uh, the, the big show in Punjab. A big wall has it, Gujarat has it, Maharashtra uh, has it. You know, so everybody is competing with each other. And that competitive spirit is driving India ahead. Thank you. I'm aware we're running out of time. I wanted to uh, take a, a couple of questions, please, from the audience. I can't, I'm blinded by the lights. I cannot really see. But please make it a question. And please uh, tell us who you uh, are asking the question to and your, your name as well. Thank you. I'm really grateful to be this wonder for the panel you've organized and for the community. You try to focus us on a strategy of what's needed to get foreign direct investment in India. And you've made it very clear. Two things the time is right for investment, and the time the government is in a good place to pursue that investment. But what I'm not sure, and my question to the panel, is whether I've heard a coherent strategy around which government and business can come together. This is not the first time the Rossus has looked at the agenda we have today. Now, I find two things that come out of today. Finance and the financial sector. Very clear. I thought the comments on corporate governance are absolutely terrific. But there are five things I didn't hear, and I wonder why they're missing from our dialogue. The first is land and the ease of acquisition. That is critically important to the success of foreign direct investment. Two, labor reform. Again, a perennial but part of the strategy, and we didn't hear a comment three, tax predictability. A sense that a foreigner bringing his assets to India will get standard, regularized, predictable tax treatment. Four, rule of law. We are making some progress by pushing arbitration and speeding court procedures strikes me as key to foreign investment. So, without overstating my piece, let me add, I think, more controversial, and that is competitiveness of leaving India open to foreign competition to drive domestic innovation. So, I put those before the panel in an attempt to try to lead this discussion with a coherent base on which business can come together to talk to government. Yes, incidentally, uh, Ambassador Vizna uh, has been uh, our guru and, uh, what should I say, a person who, uh, certainly in CII, uh, I had the pleasure of many, many interactions over uh, closed door meetings, over luncheon meetings, and his advice is very correct, and it's correct today as well. But we are moving in that direction. Uh, certainly on the taxation front, I think GST has been a big, big move, the uh, goods and services uh, taxation that we have. It's now, India today is a common market. Frank, you might recall, it was not at all common when you were there, you, you both of us used to discuss in, in a room. But today, it's, uh, and the rates are coming down. The government wants to reduce the rates to at least 18 is not lower. And most of the goods are 18, many are lower, but they're still some high and they want to bring it down to a rough uh, 18% compared to many, say, Eurasian places where the VAT is 20%. So we are moving that right. For corporate taxation, it's only come down 
to the small SMEs, and the government has promised they're going to bring it down. And I, I, I have a strong conviction that when Modi gives the commitment or his finance minister gives the commitment, he keeps that commitment, or in this case, he keeps the commitment, because we have a, for the first time, a, 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 a lady finance minister. But having said that, I think the point that he raised on labor, that's a very, very tricky one. And so, so by sense from overseas, labor is controlled, it's a concurrent subject. Uh, so the, the central government cannot make a overriding rule without the state agreeing to it. So, it, you know, it has to be decided both in the state and in the center. And there was some movement uh, in that in the early stages uh, of the Modi government, Modi won, and I'm sure it will be deepened a lot uh, in the Modi two regime. But, but answering the ambassador's question, <coughs> really, is what can we do as a go forward strategy as, a, as this organization? Um, I would suggest that we really do need a corporate group because corporates in India actually have tremendous relationships with the Indian states. So your, your concurrent subject issues, I mean, land, labor, uh, arbitration, governance, I mean, these are important critical issues that every foreign investor is going to survey the world and he's going to rank where he's going to put his money based on those items. He's absolutely right. Therefore, Ken Frank Ken Frank Richard, pull together uh, a number of corporate leaders as well as government leaders and form a group that actually brainstorms this out over the next hundred days and make the recommendation to the government on making these priority issues. That would be a go-forward step. Are you saying that we invite transfer of drinks or he invites us to the The latter. I don't know if he would go, but what you'd like to is to say thank you very much. We will uh, enjoy uh, now a dinner. Thank you very much for the rest to thank you to the Richard for organizing this meeting for IE and CII to co-sponsor it. And I believe we're all going to be making our way up to the hill to a hotel where a beautiful dinner and uh, Andre awaits us. Thank you very much.